live from the CBS Broadcast Center in Los Angeles. This is CBS 2 News at 5 p.m. All of a sudden, all we heard was pop, 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 pop. Bowlers Breaking were news in the bowling alley the shooting. That took the lives of three men in Torrance. Detectives now say they have made an arrest. Okay, we're going to get to that story in just a moment. But first, we're going to go to Randy Page, who is in downtown L.A. with more on the teacher strike. Randy? What they have been talking about all day long, whether they've made any progress with a possible strike set as soon as Thursday. Many things they've been talking about, and not only salaries, but also resources inside the schools and many other things. We do know they've been talking since about 10 o'clock this morning, and we were told they would be coming out by about 4 or 5 o'clock today. And as I mentioned, I ducked my head over to ask how soon, and they said, we're coming out right now. So what we want to try to find out here is whether we've been able to hammer out some kind of an agreement. One of the areas of concern or questions we, that have been, uh, has been circulating today is whether or not even if they do decide to strike, if they would need to wait until the 14th instead of the 10th, that's this Thursday, for some legal reasons. Those, that's kind of the minutia. The important stuff, of course, is whether or not they've been able to hammer out any kind of an agreement. I have to tell you, we haven't heard any suggestion that an agreement has been reached. And the last information we had about this is that both sides were so far off uh, that they were having a very hard time coming to some kind of an agreement. So we're going to have to wait and see what they tell us. Now, I can also tell you that we were told to expect UTLA, that's the union folks here outside of Beaudry headquarters, we were not told that the district would be here as well. If it had been a joint news conference, we most likely would have been asked to go inside the building. Now, that said, as we've learned many times, that can change at any moment. So we could hear from both sides. But we do see a very large contingent of people stepping up to the microphone here. So we're going to have to see exactly what it is that they have to tell us. In the meantime, if we're not ready to go right now, now I take it back, Alex Caputo-Pearl, who's the president of UTLA, is here. Let me get out of the way and we can see what they have to say. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alex Caputo-Pearl. I'm uh, the president of United Teachers Los Angeles, uh, also an LAUSD parent. And I've taught for 22 years in Compton and South Los Angeles. Uh, I'm here with my colleagues uh, on our bargaining team, uh, including educators from all over the city, um, from every corner of the city, uh, people with all sorts of different experience in adult education, early education, uh, K through 12, et cetera. Um, and we wanted to report on uh, what happened today uh, in bargaining. Uh, the LAUSD uh, put a proposal across the table uh, that is uh, inadequate for a number of reasons. Um, I'll go through those now. Uh, we also put a proposal across the table, which I'll give you details on in a moment. Um, the first thing that was a problem with uh, LAUSD's proposal is it continues to make a salary increase, the 3% uh, in 1617. Uh, I'm sorry, the 3% in 1718 and the 3% in 1819. It continues to make that 6% uh, contingent on cutting uh, health care for future employees, uh, which is not a good idea when you've got a teacher shortage um, to do something like that. Uh, second reason that the district's proposal today was unacceptable is that it proposes to raise class sizes uh, to, to up to up to 39 students in elementary school um, and up to 46 students in secondary school. Uh, the third reason that the uh, district proposal that came across the table today was unacceptable is that uh, it continues to not take seriously uh, the issue of privatization and unregulated charter growth, uh, which is undermining uh, the public school district to the tune of about $600 million per year. Um, the, they did have a proposal on charters, but all it was was to create a citywide task force uh, to investigate the issue of charter co-locations. Um, charter co-locations are when a charter school is uh, given space at a public district school 
often the public district school will lose its uh, parent center or lose its dance studio or lose the place where counselors talk to students um, in a case like that. And we've already had a district task force to look at the issue of charter co-location. We don't need to do it again. So that was unacceptable um, at the table today. Uh, the fourth reason that uh, the, the proposal was unacceptable is that section 1.5, uh, which is the section that allows the school district to unilaterally raise class size, in this case, even higher than the 39 in elementary that they're talking about, and even higher than the 46 uh, in secondary that they're talking about, Provision 1.5 allows them to unilaterally raise class sizes even higher than that. Um, so what they did is they, they uh, basically did a bait and switch with section 1.5. Um, they said they're getting rid of it, but then they created new language in something called 1.8, which basically says the same thing, um, that they will be able to raise class size if uh, certain of nine conditions are met. Um, and. Uh, this would this would lead to the unregulated uh, increase in class sizes and the final reason that the district's uh, proposal today was unacceptable um, is because uh, the staffing the staffing uh, positions that they offered um, there were uh, a few problems with that number one uh, the staffing that they're offering both around class size reduction and uh, for nurses librarians counselors all of that together uh, their proposal is only for um, less than one new staff person per school in the city. And if you're trying to reduce class size and have full-time nurses, when you've got 80% of our schools without a full-time nurse, it's going to take more than just one additional staff person at each school. Um, so not only is the number a problem, secondly, um, they've proposed to have some new positions for only one year. Um, so uh, we don't need a nurse, we don't need a, a full-time nurse for just one year. We need it ongoing uh, for our schools. Um, we believe that this is tied to Austin Buechner's plan to privatize the district, that if he puts some money into some schools right now for one year, it gives him time to move his mass charterization and privatization plan, and then those positions would go away uh, next year. Um, Finally, it's not even clear those positions that they're talking about, nurses, counselors, uh, class size reduction teachers, it's not even clear that they are new hires. They might just be people shuffled around uh, within the district. So for all of those reasons, their staffing proposal is insufficient. Um, the second thing that happened at the bargaining table today is that we at UTLA put a proposal across the table. Um, our proposal uh, withdrew six of our uh, previous proposals. So we've withdrawn them from the table. Um, Alex, what's, these, what's the bottom line? What happens? Well, I'll get to that. Um, the, 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 I'll get to that. So uh, we withdrew six of our proposals, including things that we don't think we should have to withdraw. And we're going to fight at the level of the Public Employee Relations Board uh, to make sure to keep them uh, able to be bargainable. So that includes issues like limiting standardized testing. That includes issues like increased decision making for parents and educators over school site budgets. Uh, we have withdrawn them uh, because we don't we don't want to uh, we don't want to fall prey to the the legal maneuvers of Austin Brut Buner, who's hired a, who's hired a bunch of high priced lawyers uh, to tell us that we can't bargain these. So we've withdrawn them. Um, but we're going to fight at the level of the Public Employee Relations Board uh, to be able to continue moving on that. Um, the punchline is that on Wednesday we will meet again, uh, Wednesday at 9 a.m. Um, we are not able to meet tomorrow because we've got to be in court tomorrow um, fighting for our right to strike if we have to strike um, because Butner has hired, again, high-priced lawyers to say that we did not give timely notification uh, to the district um, about uh, possibly striking, which of course is ridiculous. They've known this for months that it could be a possibility. Uh, so on Tuesday, we'll be in court defending our right to strike if we need to. On Wednesday at 9 a.m., uh, we will be back uh, at the bargaining table to see if we can reach an agreement 
um, that will uh, keep us from having to strike. How optimistic are you that you can reach an agreement on Wednesday? Um, we were surprised today that the district came in with, uh, with so little to offer. Um, so uh, unless something changes pretty significantly, um, there will be a strike in the city of L.A. Uh, the mood was um, the mood was diplomatic, but tense at times. Can, can you talk about what's going on in court? Uh, do you believe have, have you filed an injunction? Has the district filed an injunction over the date of the strike? Um, yeah. So let me. I'm going to get to that, Kyle. But first, let me just say an, another thing that added to some of the tension in the room today. Uh, to your point, uh, we found out in the middle of. In the middle of the negotiation session, we found out from our members at school sites that uh, they were being asked to um, distribute a letter from Austin Butner to go home to parents that basically outlined uh, the district's position on all of these issues. And our members, who Austin Butner just two months ago had told cannot talk to parents about these issues which, by the way, we're challenging uh, as an unfair labor practice. Just two months after telling our members that we can't talk to parents about these issues, he's trying to require our members to send a letter home from him about their, uh, the district side of the story. Um, that at, we confronted him about this in the room. Um, he said he uh, did not know what that letter was, but then later, but then later said that he thought that the letter was accurate. Um, so I'm not sure how you not, not know what it was and then know that it was accurate. Um, so that created some tension in the room. Um, the other thing that we All heard right, the during UTLA the day outlining the reason that they did not come to an agreement today between the UTLA and the LAUSD. Mr. Caputo Pearl outlining, outlining uh, five different reasons, Pat, that That's, they didn't agree. You are so right about that, Jeff. One of the um, reasons they continue, he says, to make uh, the 3% pay raise salary in 17, 18, and 3% in 18 and 2019, contingent on cutting health care for future employees, which they totally disagree with that. Right. They also want to raise class sizes to 39 for elementary schools and 46 um, per class size in middle school. They are still very far apart. Now, if you're wondering what the district has to say about all of this, we have been told that the district will speak to the media soon, probably within the next 20 minutes or so, and when that happens, we'll bring it to you live. All of a sudden, all we heard was pop, 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 pop. Bowlers were diving under the benches. All right, and now to the arrest in this weekend's deadly bowling alley shooting in Torrance. And CBS 2's Michelle Gili is live with more on the man they apprehended. Michelle. That's right. We've learned from police this evening that video from inside of the bowling alley is one of the things that helped lead officers to this suspect. We found out that he spent 17 years in prison and was released a couple of years ago. This coming from the Torrance Police Chief Eve Irvine. Now, this man is 47 year old Reginald Wallace of LA. He's now in custody for that triple murder that occurred Friday night just before midnight at Gable House Bowl. We have Instagram video of the chaos that ensued after shots rang out during a brawl in the bowling alley. The chief told reporters a fight started between two women in the bowling alley. Then more people joined in and eventually about 20 people were involved. The suspect Wallace, who was on parole, had a handgun, officials say. He pulled it out and began firing into the crowd. A fight broke out in the bowling alley between a couple of people. That eventually grew to several more people. At some point, it grew into multiple people. Uh, 10, 15 people all in a physical fight. At some point, uh, Mr. Wallace pulled out a handgun from his pocket and proceeded to shoot into a crowd. 
28 year old Robert Meekins was killed along with his friend Aston Edwards, who is also 28. 20 year old Michael Radford died as well. Radford and Meekins were fathers of young children. We have learned that at 7 o'clock tonight at the bowling alley, there will be a vigil for the three victims. That's the latest live here at Torrance Police Department. I'm Michelle Geely. Back to you. All right, Michelle, thank you. Now to developing news, a parolee accused of breaking into businesses to steal food. Well, he's now being charged with murdering a father of two in Malibu Creek State Park. Prosecutors are also charging Anthony Rauder with multiple counts of attempted murder. Well, they say he's been on a crime spree since at least 2016. CBS 2's Dave Lopez is live at Malibu Creek State Park with what was revealed in court today. Dave. Well, and there are also some cases that uh, reports that he could go back uh, some eight, nine years, and also possibility that he could be in the uh, Northern California uh, connection with a couple of uh, shootings that took place up there. Today in court, uh, we didn't see him because his attorney hit, uh, got in front of him, but people who live in this part of Malibu and Calabasas knew about the arrest, obviously, four months ago. It was well publicized, but they kept wondering, when are they going to charge him? Today came the answer. Anthony Rauta was strapped to what is called a safety chair. As he made a court appearance today in Van Nuys, his court-appointed attorney made certain that the cameras could not see his client, as he was formally charged with one count of murder, ten counts of attempted murder, and five counts of commercial burglary, all the crimes committed in and around the Malibu State Park area. It's insane. A ten attempts? That's not cool. Reaction from the people who live in the area. Some say they have lived in fear since a young father, Tristan Baudet, was shot and killed while sleeping in a tent in the Malibu State Park last June. His two young daughters by his side, they were not injured. And then a few months later came a rash of burglaries, mostly businesses. A man described having a rifle wearing black broke in and stole nothing but food. And then it was also revealed that there had been at least eight shootings in and around the camp area something that had not been public knowledge. We didn't even know they were occurring until the main shooting came out with the, the scientist in his, in his tent. When Rado was arrested in the hills above Malibu, detectives hit his face. He was charged only with probation violation, which meant no bail. You're a piece of That's Rauda at one of those hearings. His behavior so erratic at other court appearances that the court ordered him strapped to a safety chair and a net put over his face because he would spit on anyone who would go near him. All the while, detectives were running ballistics tests, trying to match the bullets with Rauda's gun. I have been told by several sources they have a perfect match when it comes to the shooting of the young father, and they have perfect matches in at least five of the shootings involving cars that were driving by the area. And as far as the break-ins go, I've been told that they can positively identify Rauda from the security video. According to the complaint, there are 16 charges against Rauda. It is alleged that he shot at a camper who was sleeping in a hammock, shot inside a couple of campers who were in an overnight parking spot, and shot at at least two cars that were traveling down Las Virginas. In one car, a young man and woman were on their way to go surfing. He did not enter a plea today. That will come in a couple of weeks. So bail is $1.1 million. And as for all those probation violations, well, if they hadn't charged him today, he was due to be set free, walk away, serve his time on those probation violations last Monday. Obviously, that's not, that's not going to happen now. Reporting live from uh, the Calabasas Malibu border, I'm Dave Lopez, CBS 2 News. Back to you. All right, thank you, Dave. Now, California's newest governor is charting a bold new course for the future while drawing battle lines with the Trump White House. Gavin Newsom today was inaugurated as our state's 40th governor, and CBS 2 political reporter Dave Bryan is up in Sacramento live for us with more on this new era for California politics. Dave, is it a new era? <laughs> Uh, it certainly is looking like one, Jeff. There's no question about that because not only does California have a new governor tonight, but he has a list of new priorities uh, than the past governor, and he has a new team around him to help him try to get things done. All this on a day when there was kind of a new kind of inauguration. It was a California inaugural event like none other, starting with the high-powered, energetic voices of destiny from Compton. Then a standing ovation for House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Finally, shortly after Governor Gavin Newsom was inaugurated by taking the oath of office, he launched into his inaugural address. Now more than ever, we Californians know how much 
a house matters and children. But his two-year-old son, Josh, marched onto the stage to at least temporarily steal the show. I thought it was adorable. He's, he's a very uh, rambunctious little boy, very cute, and I thought Gavin handled it very beautifully. At one point, holding Josh in his arms, Newsom used the moment to launch into a heated national issue. But, but all kids, not just the children of a governor and a filmmaker, should have a, a good life in California. It should be ripped away from their parents at the border. When things got serious, Newsom did not shy away from criticizing the Trump administration, like in this segment. We will offer an alternative to the corruption and the incompetence in the White House. And Newsom read off a long list of serious problems facing the state of California. Problems, he says, he intends to address as governor. Stagnant wages, costs that keep rising, rent, utilities, visiting the doctor, the basics are increasingly out of reach. And we have a homeless epidemic that should keep each and every one of us up at night. LA County Supervisor Mark Ridley Thomas agrees. Los Angeles has a lot to gain and benefit uh, from focus, sustained, thoughtful, compassionate leadership with respect to the homeless crisis uh, that has enveloped too many communities in Los Angeles County. California has the largest homeless population in the nation. Now, we heard just a short while ago about the possible strike at the LAUSD. We talked to some L.A.-based uh, state lawmakers here today, and some of them said they would like to see Governor Newsom get involved and try to reach some sort of help, at least reach some sort of agreement to avoid this, uh, what could be a very damaging strike. So, Jeff and Pat, uh, right off the bat, uh, the new governor's got some problems, uh, at least that some Angelino uh, lawmakers want to help him, want him, him to help. Help fix. Yep. Well, he knew that going into this. That's for sure, though, Dave. Yeah, it should be. At they've least, been around. Yeah, at least on his front burner. Yeah. Dave, all right. Thanks. thanks for that, Dave. I don't know. I, I can just use some 80 degree weather. That's all. You I'm could. Saying. You're just a little under the weather. Yeah. Garth, it's yeah, not going to happen, well, though, is it? Not for a while. No, we're in that pattern. We talked about that. Good afternoon, everybody. With all the breaking news, let's get to it. We talked about the weather pattern changing. Lo and behold, that's what's happened. About a week and a half ago, I said we'd start to see a change in it. That's what's going on. 59 degrees, winds are calm. The rain exiting the area that we've been picking up, so that's gone. 36 in a Big Bear, 57 to 58 for the most part on average throughout the area. The OC doing pretty good right now at around 63. Santa Ana, 61 into Irvine and 58 up into Ventura now. You can see the change from yesterday. A little bit warmer. That's kind of nice out there, but it's still a beautiful January day. 61 degrees, so we're 7 degrees off the pace for us. Look at this big area, low pressure sitting off San Francisco. This is going to move towards us as we start to get in towards Wednesday night. The bulk of this energy should remain up to the north. But let me take you out and show you what's going on because there's a series of low pressure areas that will begin to affect us. By tomorrow afternoon at 530, we'll start to pick up some more clouds again. So a little ridge pops up tomorrow. We do pretty well. Then by Wednesday at 6 o'clock, look at Santa Barbara up to the north. Could see a half an inch or an inch of rain up there. They saw about an inch to an inch and a half through this last system that kind of moved through there, including I talked about Ventura County line. Uh, what was that Friday night or Saturday night, Sunday morning that came to fruition as we press into Wednesday. Most of that rain should stay to the north. Thursday, we do OK, a little pop up ridge again. And then as we start to trend into Friday, that's when things will begin to change as we get to the weekend. Friday, Saturday, a little pop up ridge, so it says, but we're still tracking about a 60% chance of rain on Saturday. It kind of clears away a little bit. Then Sunday, we'll start to pick up yet again another system coming our way as we make our way into Monday. So it's kind of a roller coaster here a little bit. We'll get some breaks, but we're under a unsettled weather pattern. You can see I've got all the clouds near Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Rainfall totals, not going to say that yet. It's a ways out, but still you can see the change in the weather pattern rolling on for the IE 70. High desert's 59. The mountains coming in at 49.51 on Wednesday as well. So, Pat, no 80s in the forecast, but we are in the early part of January. Got lots of rain for you, though. We'll keep you updated. Back to you guys. Okay, thank you, Garth. I can hope. <laughs> You'll be, you, you're going to be good. I'm going to be fine. Yeah. Okay. Well, next here at 5, Amazon proves it's king of the Wall Street jungle. And Keanu Reeves talks about, yes, getting married, but not realizing he did. 